assalamu alaikum welcome back to class this is the second lecture and this is your american literature class in the last lecture i gave you a brief introduction to american literature and i also told you that as far as american literature is concerned um there's a very strong influence of american history and american political events on the literature that was being created and i gave you the timeline for um american literature and i traced some of the most important movements and i explained some of the key terms um and i hope that you all remember the key terms and the different movements that i explained um of which uh, the most significant uh, was um the puritan movement in which only um religious sermons and personal diaries uh, were being written because there was a very strong influence of the puritan movement in england and um this was followed by the um age of enlightenment and in this age um the the people who were writing and creating arts um and uh, in the literature fields they started to feel that uh, more focus had to be given to um logic and intellect rather than um what was stated in the bible or what was uh, presented in the gospels so moving on from the puritan age to the age of enlightenment um the the nature of literature also changed the third major movement that we see um over this um this this time span is the movement that is termed romanticism and this movement like the others parallels the movement that was taking place in europe whatever was being created in europe had a direct influence on what was being created in the united states um so in europe if um uh, poets and writers felt that they wanted to use imagination and they wanted to write for purposes of entertainment uh and they wanted to write in the language of ordinary human beings then in the united states the same um became uh, predominant and uh, writers who were creating uh, in the united states also followed more or less the same pattern um the only difference comes about later on when the um when then the topics uh, are related only to american frontier life um since this was the time when um land which had not been uh, settled earlier by the europeans was uh, declared open by the united states government and um europeans could go and settle there so a whole new culture rose which is known as uh, life on the frontier and that also formed a very important part of um of the literature of the period so um after the puritan and the um enlightenment ages you had the um the age of romanticism and um this was followed by um rationalism realism naturalism until you come to the 20th century and that is where you have um the movement that is known as modernism um taking its root and um the time span that this age or this movement um was uh, responsible for uh, creating in is the time from the beginning of the first world war to the end of the second world war so 1945 is the time when modernism comes to an end and anything that is produced after 1945 is classified as postmodern or um contemporary so just to give you a bit about um what was being um created here um after the romantic uh, period you had um a period that is or an age or a movement that is known as transcendentalism and some of the writers who were writing uh, with the transcendentalist approach 
paralleled the romantic age or the romantic movement um, two of these I can tell you are Thoreau Henry David Thoreau and um, whose, um, whose, whose work Walden is very very famous in American literature it's one of the seminal works and um, then you had Emerson writing essays Ralph Waldo Emerson um, is one of those uh, writers who is classified as a romantic as well as a transcendentalist um, the transcendentalists uh, focused not so much on the Bible but on um, the fact that human beings did not need any intervening power or institution in their communication with the divine being or the divine spirit so um, when you um, have transcendentalism taking hold and that took a very small uh, period of time and there were not many people who could uh, who could be fit into the category of uh, transcendentalist writers um, but it's a very important part of American literature because there was um, that concept of uh, spirituality without there being any um, religious references so um, what uh, what what happened after the Second World War um, was that um, a lot of disillusionment um, despair and confusion had already been created by the First World War but the Second World War sort of put the lid on it the kind of literature that was being written in the modern age or under the ages of modernism raised questions without giving any answers the kind of literature that was um, created in what is known as uh, postmodernist movement or what is classified as contemporary American literature raised issues and problems but it did not provide solutions so what you find in postmodernism is a different approach postmodernism questions everything that is established and says that there's more than one way of looking at things so what you have in the literature that was produced from 1946 to the present day is all postmodern and it's all contemporary so the issues in contemporary American literature are different in the modern age you had um, Harlem Renaissance um, running parallel um, with its issues of race and ethnicity and um, the fact that you had um, multi-ethnic literature being produced in the first half of the 20th century is evidence of um, the rise of um, realization that all communities had basic rights uh, and this movement sort of came to a head in the postmodern age or in contemporary American literature because in contemporary American literature you have the literature of the minorities also you have the literature of the South Asians you have literature of the Chinese the Japanese um, and all those European um, nations that formed uh, a part of the original um, colonizing group and you also have literature of the African Americans uh, in continuation with the Harlem Renaissance and um, you also have literature of the original inhabitants of the Americas that is the Native Americans or the American Indians uh, whatever name you give them so the 1960s and 70s was a very critical period for American history as well uh, as American politics and therefore American literature uh, because this was the time when all other movements started to join the uh, movement for civil rights you had um, the homosexuals and gays calling for uh, recognition you had the American Indians uh, saying that they wanted their rights 
uh, and not just their responsibilities and duties outlined. Um, you had people from other ethnicities, other parts of the world also claiming that they were American and therefore they were very much a part of um, the American mainstream and they could not be marginalized, they could not be put on the sides and said you don't matter. So because you had all these communities demanding their rights, the literature of the time also bears evidence of whatever was going on in society, whatever issues were being addressed were being directly dealt with in the literature. That's been a, a kind of a long recap of the, the previous um, lecture, but this is very necessary because whatever we are going to be studying in this module will be in the backdrop of American history, American political, economic, um, and uh, cultural situations. So uh, I want you to keep these movements very firmly in mind. You have the PowerPoints and you can refer to them again and again. You can go over your um, handbook notes and um, see the different movements um, that, uh, that form a part of American literature. Now it's not possible for me to deal with um, texts from all the different movements because um, of the limited number of lectures that are um, allotted. But I'm going to try to make this module as interesting as possible and as um, broad in uh, its understanding of American literature as it is possible. Okay, so let's go on with the PowerPoint. Now, what I'm going to start off today with is the timeline for the text. These are the texts that I hope to deal with um, in this module. In the course of these um, 31, uh, 32 lectures um, that are given to me, I'm going to try to deal with all these texts. But if I miss out on any one of them, you will know that it is because we didn't have time for them. I'm giving you the names so that even if we do not deal with them in class, you can Google them, get the text, and um, see that you read it and study it and try to uh, look at it from the point of view of its being a representative. Okay, we're going to start with um, Emerson's uh, essay on self-reliance and uh, that means that we start uh, from 1841. It's not possible for me to start with text um, written in the 15th century because you would not be able to uh, make sense of it and it would not really be relevant to it. What is important is for you to know how the different movements are uh, represented. Uh, I'm not including the Puritan movement for the simple reason that most of what was being written there was either personal diaries or religious sermons. So I, I, my attempt is to make this module as interesting as possible also. So after the, um, the essay on self-reliance, we're going to deal with a short story by Herman Melville. Um, and this was first published in 1856. The story is titled Bartleby the Scrivener and it's one of the most famous short stories uh, in American literature. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer um, is a book that was written by Mark Twain. Uh, um, of course, Mark Twain is not his real name. His um, real name was uh, Samuel Clemens, but he wrote under the pen name of Mark Twain. And um, because Mark Twain um, lived in the Mississippi Delta area, most of what he is writing concentrates on that region, that area. So um, the adventures of Tom Sawyer uh, and the adventures of Huckleberry Finn were basically written for young adults, that is um, for um, young men who were just crossing their teens. But since it is a very representative uh, text in terms of the time, the region, uh, and the writer. Mark Twain is one of the big uh, voices 
in American literature. And so um, I have included um, a, a chapter from The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. If you remember when we were doing prose 2 in the previous semester, um, I included a couple of um, short stories. You had uh, um, The Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and um, you had a couple of other uh, short stories also by Mark Twain. So I did not want to include another short story. Instead, I have taken a chapter from the novel and we're going to discuss um, this chapter in uh, one of the classes um, in the near future. And then we have another representation from the Harlem Renaissance and this is um, an, an excerpt um, that is titled How It Feels to be Colored Me. It's very important. Zora Neale Hurston um, is one of the most important writers of um, the Harlem Renaissance and uh, no representation of um, the time and the age and the movement would be complete without some representation from Zora Neale Hurston. So with Hurston, we go to skip to the 20th century. And um, this will be followed by Faulkner's Barn Burning, which is a short story and which was written in 1939. Um, William Faulkner, again, is one of the representatives of, um, the, of, of regionalists. Uh, in the sense that he is writing about the southern states and um, whatever life was like in, um, in, 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 in the states south of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, the Faulkner's um, story is going to be followed by the only play that you're going to have um, in this module and that is The Glass Menagerie by um, Tennessee Williams. Tennessee Williams is a very representative um, contemporary American dramatist, short story writer, poet, but in this module I have included his play, um, one of the most famous plays, The Glass Menagerie. Williams has also written other plays and um, what sets Tennessee Williams apart from other dramatists is the fact that a lot of his plays were converted into films. Uh, a Streetcar Named Desire is one, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is another one. Um, so if you get a chance, you can uh, watch these um, movies, you can download them and that will give you a very good idea of the kind of uh, writing that um, Tennessee Williams was doing because um, in the 20th century there is very little drama being produced. I have not included poetry here but somewhere during the course of your module I'm also going to include um, a few poems by Emily Dickinson if you have not studied that already. Uh, and Emily Dickinson because she's a very representative um, poet uh, and I feel that there should be more representation of women writers in your American literature module. So somewhere I'm going to include a couple of poems by um, Emily Dickinson also. And the last text that we'll be dealing with um, is uh, probably the only short story that Toni Morrison ever written. This story was published in 1984. And you know that Toni Morrison is one of the most famous um, African-American uh, novelist. Uh, she is the only one who has not only a Pulitzer Prize uh, and uh, a National Book Circle um, uh, Prize, but uh, she, um, her, her um, books have been converted into films and have also won awards there. And if you get a chance to see her beloved, you have um, the very famous um, actress and uh, talk show host Oprah Winfrey, who is acting in Beloved. Um, what we're going to include here, because we do not have time or space for a full novel, uh, what we're going to do is include uh, a short story. Um, and that is um, 
uh, that that is something that's going to sort of round off um, the entire uh, module so uh, we start with self-reliance and this is an essay by Rolf Waldo Emerson uh, and uh, just before we go to the text of uh, self-reliance I want to read out some lines uh, which form a part of the text but which are verse uh, quotes um, and form the beginning of the essay on self-reliance. Emerson, if you remember, is one of those who is known as uh, the transcendentalist as well as um, uh, belonging to that small group of writers who believed that uh, human beings did not need the mediation of the church in their dealings with the divine spirit or um, with, with, with God himself. So um, throughout his focus is on um, relying on no outside forces but on your own inner strength. Man is his own star and the soul that can render an honest and a perfect man commands all light, all influence, all fate. Nothing to him's fall early or too late. Our acts, our angels are, or good or ill, our fatal shadows that walk by us still. So the gist of these lines is what Emerson has tried to convey in the text of the essay. Through various examples he shows us that human beings must learn to rely only on themselves and not on external forces. Or nobody else is going to uh, help you, nobody else is trustworthy, you alone are um, trustworthy. So nothing to him fall early or too late. The person who um, can be honest and perfect does not need any outside help, does not need any outside agency. He has strength in himself and he can do anything and everything. He doesn't need any help at all. Cast the bantling on the rocks, suckle him with the she-wolf's teeth, wintered with the hawk and fox, power and speed be hands and feet. Okay, so reliance, total reliance on the self, not on an external force, not on an outside agency, not holding anyone else responsible, but total and complete reliance on the self. So, so much for the verse text and now we start with the text of the essay and Emerson says, I read the other day some verses written by an eminent painter which were original and not conventional. So a very uh, subtle strike at uh, poets who copied the style or the contents of other poets. So these were original lines and um, not uh, conventional. The soul always hears an admonition in such lines, let the subject be what it may. The sentiment they instill is of more value than any thought they may contain. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. Okay, so he says that I read a few lines the other day and what impressed me was that um, it advocates total reliance on the self. He says the sentiment they instill is of more value than any thought they may contain. So the feelings and the emotions conveyed in those lines are very very important and they have a lasting impact. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men. In other words, to wish for your neighbor what you wish for yourself. That is genius. That is the crux of 
all that is human and humane, all that is noble. Speak your latent conviction and it shall be the universal sense. For the inmost in due time becomes the outmost. And our first thought is rendered back to us by the trumpet of the last judgment. Familiar as the voice of the mind is to each, the highest merit we ascribe to Moses, Plato and Milton is that they set not books and traditions and spoke not what men but what they thought. Now, here's the thought. Um, what Emerson is trying to convince us of is that we must depend only on ourselves. And in order to do that, he gives certain examples. The first example that he brings up is that of um, the great philosophers, Moses, Plato, Milton. He says, these three men are revered, are given a lot of respect. Why? The one reason that Emerson can come up with is that these people believed. They believed that they were right and that all others were wrong. Now the example that he's taken up is Moses, Plato and Milton. These three people were disbelieved in their time. The prophet Moses was disbelieved by the Pharaoh. In spite of that, he continued to work for the betterment of um, his people, of what are called the children of Israel. So he continued to work for their betterment. Plato, the philosopher, had his um, theories challenged. Milton, the blind poet, Puritan poet, um, wrote the Paradise Lost and still had the project of Paradise Regained to complete. But the volume of work that he was able to produce impresses people not just because that's a lot of poetry but because whatever he is presenting is his thought, his idea. If Moses um, stood up against the Pharaoh it was because he had conviction. If Plato expounded theories, it was because he had conviction. He believed in those theories. Not because he had heard these theories from other people. So the reason why he points out to these three people is because these three people had original ideas. Not only did they have original ideas, but they also had the conviction that they were right and that the rest of the world was wrong. When the rest of the world was against Milton for producing so much and saying um, you are being cruel to your daughters because your daughters have to transcribe every word um, that you tell them. Milton was convinced of the rightness of the occasion, the time and what he was writing. Just as Moses was convinced that what he was saying was right and what Pharaoh and the Egyptians were saying was all wrong. So, reliance on the self. A man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought because it is his. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. Great works of art have no more affecting lesson for us than this. So a man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light 
which flashes across his mind from within. Whenever he has these brilliant ideas, as you call them, these brain waves, he must pay attention to that brain wave. Do not disregard that thought. Don't discard that idea because you think it is too revolutionary. Chances are that that particular idea will transform your whole life. So uh, do not dismiss these thoughts, these ideas, because um, in every work of genius, we recognize our own discarded ideas, ideas that we discard, that we throw away. Somebody else picks up and builds it up, and before you know it, you feel sorry because you rejected that idea and someone else has worked on it. So great works of art have no more affecting lesson for us than this. We think that we cannot do such and such a thing. We can't paint, we can't make this sculpture, we can't write this poem. And so we discard these ideas. But other people go ahead and they pick up those ideas, they build them up and when you see the work, you say, oh, that's genius. And the person will say, yes, I took up the idea that you threw away. And this is what I have as the final product. So don't throw away brain waves. Don't throw away these bright ideas that you get. They teach us to abide by our spontaneous impression with good humor flexibility than most when the whole cry of noises is on the other side. Else, Tomorrow, a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt all the time and we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. In other words, ideas that we discard, other people take them up, build them up and if we hear our own ideas being um, produced by other people, we can only feel embarrassment because we did not build up on that idea. So don't discard these ideas. There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion, that though the whole universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. The power that resides in him is new in nature and none but he knows what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. Not for nothing one face, one character, one fact makes much impression on him and another none. So. He says there's a time in every man's education when he feels that if he copies someone, it's going to be suicide. That if he envies someone an idea, it shows his ignorance. But this is the only life we have. And so we need to make the most of it. And we can only do that if we take our ideas when they occur to us and transform them into reality because we will not get anything without trying, without attempting. We will not be able to get anything at all. This sculpture in the memory is not without pre-established harmony. If you have an image in the mind, there is a reason for it. It doesn't just come into your mind without any reason. The eye was placed, and this is very important, the eye was placed where one ray should fall that it might testify of that particular ray. See how deep the meaning is here. The eye was placed, if we have these eyes, they are placed so that the light from the sun strikes these eyes and they become visible to other people. So this eye exists not for us to see with, but for that one ray of light to strike and return. 
we but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. It may be safely trusted as proportionate and of good issues, so it may be faithfully imparted, but God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. Okay, so whatever we do, we must take credit for it. We must not be embarrassed, we must not be ashamed because we're doing something. Um, whatever God has planned for us to do, we shall do that. But God's work is not done by cowards, done by the courageous and um, the brave. A man is relieved and gave and he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt, his genius deserts him, no muse befriends, no invention, no hope. So, um, a person is happy when he does his work wholeheartedly. But side by side with this is the thought of what he has not done or what he has been unable to do. And that thought eats him up from within. That thought uh, corrodes him from within until he can think of nothing else but what he has done wrong. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt, his genius deserts him. No muse befriends, no invention, no hope. So when he starts thinking this way, then he cannot do any work. No genius befriends him. Um, no muse comes near him. He cannot create poetry. He can't create um, drama or prose or whatever. He cannot because there is that sense of um, inferiority that he possesses. The golden words here that Emerson emphasizes again and again are two. Trust thyself. Trust thyself. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that string. Everyone believes that. Accept the place the divine providence has found for you, the society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Do not go out of your way to get more. Because whatever is fated for you is given to you. Great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception that the absolutely trustworthy was seated at their heart, working through their hands, predominating all their being. So trust yourself. Do not repose trust in anyone else. Do not think that your contemporaries, your acquaintances, your friends, your family know more about it. You are the one who knows the most. You are the trustworthy one. You are the honest one. And you must take care that you have these two golden words repeated to yourself day in and day out. And that is trust thyself. And we are now men and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny and not minors and invalids in a protected corner, not cowards fleeing before a revolution, but guides, redeemers and benefactors, obeying the almighty effort and advancing on chaos and the dark. Now you see, certain words Emerson writes starting with a capital letter. Now you might think that's strange, but I want you to remember whenever you come across such a word that this word has significance that is greater than the other words. So he says, we are men, we must accept responsibility, we must shoulder responsibility, and we must not be like cowards fleeing before a revolution. We must be guides, redeemers, 
benefactors because our job is to advance on chaos and darkness we have the divine being in us we have a spirit we have a soul that soul must manifest itself in acts of bravery rather than cowardice in acts of intelligence rather than stupidity in acts of understanding rather than of ignorance all these we must do because we are the guides we are the redeemers we are the benefactors we cannot hope to have other people being given that those titles and um, being um, given this task of removing chaos confusion and darkness and bringing in order organization and light what pretty oracles nature yields us on this text in the face and behavior of children babes and even brutes that divided and rebel mind that distrust of a sentiment because our arithmetic has computed the strength and means opposed to our purpose these have not their mind being whole their eye is as yet unconquered and when we look in their faces we are disconcerted infancy conforms to nobody all conform to it so that one babe commonly makes four or five out of the adults who prattle and play to it now here's a very interesting idea that emerson has presented and he says you know if you start thinking about trust thyself there's a whole um volume of lessons that is encompassed in these two words he says it's only adults who feel fear the fear of the unknown the fear of the known human beings are always afraid of something they are afraid of their elders they are afraid of um their juniors and then he brings in this totally startling comparison and he gives us the image of 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 a baby an infant and he says you think a baby is afraid of anyone no for a baby there is no friend or foe all conform to that baby the baby doesn't follow anyone everyone follows the baby and you know it's really funny um if you have uh, noticed when a child learns to walk an elder child or an elder follows the child and adopts the same manner of walking if you see a baby crawling you'll see a whole line of children who can walk crawling after that baby as he says one babe can make four or five out of the adults who prattle and play to it have you ever heard how people talk to children little children babes infants they don't talk the way you and i do they at once regress to the level of the baby and if the baby says dada mama dog the the adult will make the same sound the adult will forget its language the adult will forget its manners and will start following the baby so it says one babe has such power because the babe or the infant does not need to follow anyone in other words the baby has more sense has more logic than the adult who follows the baby okay so god has armed youth and puberty and manhood no less with its own piquancy and charm and made it enviable and gracious and its claims not to be put by if it will stand by itself do not think the youth has no force because he cannot speak to you and me 
Hark! In the next room, his voice is sufficiently clear and emphatic. It seems he knows how to speak to his contemporaries. Bashful or bold then, he will know how to make seniors very unnecessary. So God has armed youth and puberty, teenagers and young adults, and has given it a special charm, a charm that is restricted for that particular age group, not for anyone else. And we admire that charm. We want that charm. We would like to be again turned into young men or teenagers because they have so much charm. Everyone says, oh, they've got such wonderful ideas. But then why can you not have wonderful ideas? Why must you only hear of them from young adults? Do not think the youth has no force. The young people are very strong. They have a force. They may not speak in front of you, but that is out of respect. If you keep silent, and you strain your ears, maybe, maybe, in the room next to yours, they will be speaking. And if you try to listen hard enough, you will see that their ideas are far better than yours can ever be. Bashful or bold, he will know how to make us seniors very unnecessary. So the, 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 um, the young man may appear to be very shy, very reserved, but if you give him his own space and you give him time, he will come up with ideas that you would like to claim as your own. So do not think that youth does not know anything. We people have a tendency to say, oh, you don't know anything. That's not true. Young people know far more than us adults. So young men um, have a lot of um, force, a lot of energy, um, lots of ideas. And the important thing that you need to know is that young men will not follow you. You have to follow them because they have all the ideas. Their concepts are very clear. So you must follow the generation that's coming after you. As soon as he has once acted or spoken, he is a committed person, washed by the sympathy or the hatred of hundreds whose affections must now enter into his account. So um, young boys do not care what other people think about them and that is why they can come up with these new and revolutionary ideas and they are not afraid of anyone. He says, they will not quote you, you must quote him. And there is no lethe for this. Ah, that he could pass again into his neutrality. Who can thus avoid all pledges and having observed, observe again from the same unaffected, unbiased, unbribable, unaffrighted innocence must always be formidable. So anyone who can avoid um, promises, avoid committing um, is to be reckoned with, is to be afraid of. We cannot forget these things. These things are always there um, in front of us uh, as examples for us. And we need to make sure that we take proper advantage of these. We must look at what these young men are telling us. He would utter opinions on all passing affairs which being seen to be not private but necessary would sink like darts into the ear of men and put them in fear. So these young men are not afraid of anything. It's we, the old, the middle-aged, the adults who are afraid. That age you have no fears whatsoever. These are the voices which we hear in solitude and you will not hear their voices when there are a lot of people speaking. You will only hear them in solitude. 
but they grow faint and inaudible as we enter into the world. So there, these voices do exist. They are there, uh, but the more and more that we go into the world, the more and more materialistic that we become, the fewer the chances of these voices penetrating. So comes a time when we become immune to everything else. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better security of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. So society is like a company, a company in which all of us jointly own stock and out of which we all make money. Um, the virtue in most request is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. Again, a very important point here. He says, the virtue in most is conformity. Do you and can you conform or are you a revolutionary? That is the, the million dollar question as they say. Whoso would be a man must be a non-conformist. If you want to be a man, you cannot conform. If you conform, you're not a man. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore of it, if it be goodness. Nothing is at last cared but the integrity of your own mind. Absolve you to yourself and you shall have the suffrage of the world. So if you conform, and remember young men do not conform, if you conform, you are done with. Then you lose interest for the whole world. Because you conform, you follow what the other people are doing. But he says, do not conform. Young men do not conform. Young men says, I know what, I, what is right. The, uh, we will do things my way. They don't say, okay, I'll follow you. They'll say, no, it's my way. So when you say that things have to be my way, then you are not conforming. And we all need to be non-conformist so that we come up with beautiful, bright ideas and ideas um, that will make a revolutionary change in the world. <clears throat> I remember an answer when quite, which when quite young I was prompted to make to a valued advisor who, would, who was wont to importune me with the dear old doctrines of the church. On my saying, what have I to do with the sacredness of traditions, if I live wholly from within, my friend suggested, but these issues may be, may be from below, not from above. So he says, the one thing that makes us into very valued advisors is if you do not give me the old doctrines of the church. Now, here, Emerson is coming up with a very revolutionary idea. What he says, and this is in the spirit of transcendentalism, is that between God and man, there must be nothing, no one. There must be direct communication. If you bring in the church, you bring in the priests, then you are making that path more complicated. If you start from point E, and this is point B, you want to get from point A to B, you can do that by traveling in a straight line. But if you have something else in between, let's say you have point C in between, then when you start from point A, you will go to first point C, and then from C you will go to B. But Emerson does not advocate that. He says that this point C, which is the church, should not be there. 
human beings must communicate directly with their creator. So you can consider this as um, blasphemy, but this is what we have to inculcate in, uh, in our youth. So um, this is how he goes about it. I think we're going to um, stop here. Let me quickly recap what we have done today um, so that the beginning of um, this module that, um, that, that we are laying, the sort of foundation that we are laying is very, very strong and then we can build whatever we want to upon it. So um, I, uh, th this essay that I'm doing with you is written by Rolf Waldo Emerson and Emerson is one of the uh, transcendentalist group of um, writers who believed that there must be direct communication between man and God, man or the, and the divine spirit and there must be no intermediary and he considers the church as um, an intermediary, as um, an institution that um, destroys the communication between a human being and the divine spirit. So Emerson is one of um, those writers who belonged to uh, and who wrote in the manner of transcendentalism and um, he is very very specific about his ideas. He says that um, we should not accept the church as an intermediary. We should not accept other human beings as intermediary, but we must deal directly with the Almighty, with um, the God of all, um, the, of, of the whole universe. And so, um, he says that um, you, you need to uh, make sure that you trust only yourself, you rely only on yourself, you cannot rely on anyone else because you know best what you want. And if you start trusting other people or if you give that responsibility to other people, then you cannot expect the best of results then you cannot hold anyone responsible. And um, transcendentalists worked on the premise that the relationship between God and man is a unique one, cannot be duplicated. Um, and therefore there must be no intermediary, there must be no power or no section of humanity um, preventing the two from communicating um, directly. We started off by um, a sort of run through of the different movements and then I told you that these are some of the texts that we will be doing and I pointed out that the first text that we will be doing is um, the essay on self-reliance by Ralph Waldo um, Emerson and that is going to be followed by uh, Melville's story Bartleby the Scrivener uh, and um, you have a whole uh, lot of uh, texts like um, you have um, the, the story by Zora Neale Hurston, you have um, the play by Tennessee Williams and um, you, you, you have the, the, probably the only short story that um, Tony Morrison um, wrote is, is also included. And I also told you that um, if possible I'm going to include a couple of poems by um, Emily Dickinson because I don't think that any module on American literature um, can be complete without uh, mentioning uh, Emily Dickinson. And um, I also told you that um, the, um, the, the, the present times are known as contemporary times and whatever is being written now is being considered postmodern because 
postmodernism accepts other views of life. It does not really um, harp upon one view of life, which may be that of the teacher or the scholar or um, the writer. Um, so um, th this is what he's advocating. And his essay on self-reliance, throughout it all, he is emphasizing that human beings must trust themselves and themselves only and uh, must not um, put the responsibility on to someone else. Human beings have to accept responsibility for themselves and um, once they learn to do that all their problems, all their issues um, will be resolved. And he also gives this example of everyone conforming to um, a small child and the small child conforming to, um, to, to nobody else. Uh, and um, the fact that as human beings we need to, um, we need to conform and conform um, not with um, our children, but um, we, we, we need to follow whatever children say, whatever they do, whatever they tell us. We cannot expect children to, fo to follow us. And then for, and in order to emphasize this uh, point, he gives the example of a little baby who, uh, who makes babies out of four or five adults because whatever he does no matter what uh, he says the adults in an uh, in in an attempt to communicate with him will regress will start to do the same things that he does will start to speak in um, in the same way and that's something that you and I have observed very frequently so um, this, this is where we're going to end for today. And inshallah, in the next lesson, we're going to continue the essay on Emerson. It's a rather long essay, and it's going to take us a couple of classes um, to wind it up. And then, of course, um, we will go on with our uh, next topic for English 553. Thank you for your patience and Allah Hafiz.